go. Hey, what's going on, everyone? It's Tommy with District A Strength and Fitness. I have our head coach today, Robert Johnson, as well as founder and CEO of Performer Field Nutrition, Devin Ford. Um, and today, guys, we're going over part two of the Performer Fuel seminar that's going to be happening here. This one specifically, August 29th on Sunday. And so kind of the last discussion we had talked about genomics. I wanted to bring on Devin and Robert to talk more about the performance stuff that we're going to be doing on Sunday. And so just as a reminder to give Devin a proper introduction, uh, Devin's been the founder and CEO of Performa Fuel Nutrition since when, Devin? 2000 and... Oh, God, I don't even know. Six, seven years ago, somewhere in there. Okay, so he's been doing this for a while. Also a world-class athlete, going to be competing in the uh, World Strongman Championships in the 90-kilogram weight class this November. So excited to see him do that. And just a wealth of knowledge when it comes to all things nutrition, performance, um, exercise, physiology. So um, just to kick things off, you guys, um, I wanted to introduce our listeners and our members to this idea of how technology has kind of progressed in the last five to six years and what we can do with it. And so let's just start with the nearest technology and the MOXIE. Um, Devin, what is it? What can we do with it? Um, and what's kind of like, the, the coolest thing that we can do that we haven't been able to do in the last 10 years? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so NEARS, uh, which stands for Near Infrared Spectroscopy, if that's pronounced correctly, um, is, or the most usable version of NEARS would be MOXIE, which is probably how people would know of NEARS. Oh, did my screen freeze? Yeah, you're okay. We're good? Okay. I can hear you, yeah. Stop. <laughs> So the most usable version of NEARS would be MOXIE. Uh, and MOXIE, for people who have not seen it or used it before, is basically a like two by two inch little square rectangle that you can put on a limb, uh, whether it's a working limb, like a leg or an arm or something like that. And you would tape it onto the limb to give you real time data as you're doing some sort of exercise protocol or some sort of testing protocol. And what it measures is a couple of things. Uh, it's also dependent on how you're using it, but basically there's two big things that you look for when you're using NEARS, which would be uh, blood flow, which they would label as total hemoglobin, as well as oxygen use, which they would label as saturated muscle oxygenation or SMO2. And between those two things, you get a wealth of knowledge of that athlete and how they perform or how they test and where their limiters are and how to then use that information to come up with some sort of training protocol uh, to fix those limiters. And those limiters would be almost impossible to understand or realize without that technology. You would basically just be assuming or guessing what the limiters were from the outside looking in. This gives you the ability to look from the inside out. Yeah, and, and what I love about it is that this idea of understanding people on a more personal level in terms of what's actually happening inside their body. Because, you know, as a coaching staff, and Robert knows this better than anybody, like we can kind of we can kind of guess probably what's going on inside your body based on how you perform. But this gives you actually like acute data at the localized level about what's actually happening inside your body. So 30,000 foot view, Devin. What are the big energetic limiters that mainly affect people? I know there's three big categories, but maybe you can kind of just from a broad perspective say like, hey, most people are dealing with one of three issues. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's a tough question to answer quickly. But I would say when most people are using the Moxie or what most people would use the Moxie and or Pinoy for would be to see if an athlete is limited by either O2 utilization or O2 delivery. And within that O2 delivery would then be a couple of different things, mainly being uh, cardiac related. So the heart strength and ability to push out the oxygen uh, and also respiratory. So the actual system of the body that can then either intake enough O2 or expel enough CO2. So I think first determining whether the athlete is limited with how much oxygen they can use. So oxygen inside the muscle, just as a little cliff note, um, is stored in myoglobin. And sometimes athletes are limited and not able to use the oxygen that's already in the muscle. So that's number one to figure out. If they can use the oxygen effectively within the muscle, then it comes down to how well they can replenish the oxygen back to the muscle once they've used it. And that then comes down to a couple of different limiters, which is typically either from the heart not being strong enough or the respiratory system not being 
strong enough or enduring enough to breathe properly to get the oxygen in. That's probably a very simple view, but yeah. I think no, that's but, but easy for members to understand. So for those of you guys who start to peter out in workouts, like what Devin was talking about is it basically comes down to three big things, right? Like you're just, you don't have the oxygen is getting delivered to your muscle, but your muscles just can't use it because there's not enough high term mitochondrial density. Like we just don't, we're not utilizing the amount of oxygen and enough powerhouse in your muscles to do it. Um, maybe it's your breathing mechanics. You can't clear CO2 or you're just not getting enough inhalation or exhalation um, to make sure that oxygen is getting delivered to the muscle or just this, the heart's not strong enough to keep up with the amount of work that you're doing. Right. So we can actually start to tailor programming based on understanding where it is that you are limited in your performance. And this is where I kind of wanted to bring Robert in a little bit because Robert's been experimenting with Moxie um, for the last few months. And Robert, I kind of wanted you to talk a little bit about your experience with the Moxie so far, what you've learned about yourself and how you've adapted even your own training when it comes to the feedback that you're getting from the Moxie sensors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's a good note. I think Devin summed it up really, really well, uh, touching on all the bases of it. But I think for me, I've kind of found as an athlete through testing a little bit with the Moxies is that I have very limited in regards to how I cycle the blood through my body. So like utilizing the blood and getting it to my actual muscle and being able to use it has been the biggest limiter for me. So a lot of the stuff I've been kind of diving into and doing is kind of like longer, more slow, sustained aerobic paces at a low intensity to where my body can kind of keep up pumping the blood and getting the oxygen to the, to the muscles and then letting my body kind of slowly adapt to that and just slightly increasing week to week in what I do. Yeah. And I think what's amazing about that is, so Robert's probably one of the highest level athletes, you know, at least in Texas, I think it's completely fair to say. And what, what he's basically saying is doing more CrossFit isn't actually making you a better athlete. It's, it's actually backing off a little bit and saying, Hey, Robert, we need you to like, just go do some power walking around track or something like that <laughs> to slow it down a little bit. Like from, one of from things where it's yeah, like, Oh, I'll say it's one of those things where it's funny. It's like coming from such like a powerful athlete background and just smashing intensity, smashing, lifting, doing all this thing. It's like, okay, your body's really good at just occluding, pumping blood to the muscle and just keeping it there. And you can explode really well. It's like, well, that's not always the greatest for CrossFit. That's not yeah. going to make you better at that. Like you're going to look jacked, but you're probably going to be the finishing last in regards to the class workout of the day. Word. It reminds me a lot of Matt Fraser when he would talk about like those rowing, those 45 minute rowing intervals he would do where it's just like long, sustainable work, you know, of just building an aerobic base. Um, and he's obviously, you know, the fittest man ever to ever to compete in the sport. Devin, what I wanted to pick your brain about was because you you coach Robert for many years and like without Nears technology, you have to kind of back into this by like, okay, I'm seeing these results. Maybe we're struggling here. We're a little bit struggling. Do you want to speak to that a little bit about not having the technology and you just trying to do your best to accommodate based on Robert's performance? Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a rough one. So it's, it's interesting because even before I started using uh, Moxie sensors, I had some idea or some abstract idea that something was probably wrong with my breathing, which at the time was like completely ignored i think in the crossfit world i don't think i've ever heard anybody talk about respiratory systems in the crossfit world um and i wound up going to like joel jameson i don't know if you're familiar with him but he bounced me to aaron davis who's the guy that evan uh, was partnered with with the moxies and uh, it wasn't until i actually saw the moxie where it actually made sense to me what was going on but even having some idea and even researching that idea on how to improve that, but not having the data or the technology to actually see it was super difficult. So even having the idea, even understanding the science behind it, even understanding possible protocols that could help it, it was still really difficult to do without the technology. Um, I think Evan is probably one of the best that I've seen be able to coach people without the technology and get a really good response from it. Um, but you basically just have to go off experience. Like I've, I've seen, and I've done it myself with a lot of athletes where you can put them through some sort of test and their subjective markers. Like a lot of it comes down to like pooling of blood in like your legs or something like that. If you're doing some sort of assault bike test, uh, you can give the subjective feedback of stopping when you feel like you have that pooling sensation or that burning in your legs. And everybody kind of knows what that feels like when you're on the assault bike or so bike and your legs just get really fucking heavy and they feel like they're going to pop. Um, and that's purely an occlusion. 
And based on that subjective feedback and when that's happening at what time during the intervals and all that kind of stuff, you can get some idea of whether what type of limitation it is. Um, and then from there, you can give them protocols based on that, but it's, it's really difficult. Uh, it's really, really difficult. I give Evan a lot of props for being able to do that uh, without the technology, but even with him, it's so much better with the technology. I mean, it's, it's really night and day. And, and taking it back to you, Robert, like, based like when you started when you were still working with Devin and doing your programming and I know you did a lot of strength work um but you still did a lot of like long aerobic intervals you know like kind of seeing where um kind of where your power output could take you but how has your training changed a ton since starting with Evan and learning more about your physiology like what's been the most dramatic change for you I think honestly the biggest change is doing different energy style training but mostly practicing the sport a little bit more to get better at not only the energy system training, but comp helping my body learn how to compensate a little bit better while also getting my energy systems a little bit better. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. So how much, like what percentage of your training is strength work right now? Very, very small. <laughs> very, very small. <laughs> and I'm like I, me and Devin have been going back and forth about this. It's, it's, uh, it's tough. It's tough. But uh, Devin actually just said this to me the other day to be the strong or you have to give up being the strongest to be the fittest. Cause you look at the strongest athletes out there, like the Nikki Rankars, the Scott Panchecks, the Sam and dancers, the yeah. deadlift They're They're there. They're at the games, but they're by no means at the top. And then you look at the guys at the top, like Justin Medeiros maybe has like a 530 pound deadlift, you know, like something along those lines, like you're not, you can't be that strong and that fit along your spectrum. You only have so much, adaptation currency to work with so you have to be smart about how you pick and choose and for me it's uh turning into a skinny crossfitter yes <laughs> amen <laughs> so so now kind of pivoting away from moxie real quick and so Devin, this question is for you so the panoe system so the idea of being able to use a portable metabolic cart machine um that can measure things like vo2 max tidal volume do you want to speak to that technology a little bit whereas like 10 years ago you'd have to spend like 35 grand on like a medical device just to get this. But now you have access to this portable machine where you can measure all of this and you can also do it like not on a treadmill. You could do it on a salt bike. We could do a track workout. We could do rowing intervals. We could do whatever. Speak to that a little bit. And I know you just started digging into this, but what is Panoe? What can you do with it? Let's start with the performance. We'll get dig into the nutrition in a second. And then how does it pair well with Moxie? Yeah, that's a really good uh, question. Remind me if I forget anything you just said. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just put it. Uh, so the first thing I want to start with is how it pairs with the Moxie, because once I actually started using the Moxie, um, you know, and identifying certain limiters, even with using the Moxie, there were still a lot of limitations that you couldn't really see. Like, for instance, when you understood that the athlete had an O2 delivery problem and you could see that on the Moxie, then you had to go ahead and decide whether that was from a cardiac point of view or whether that was the respiratory system that was failing. And that was really hard to understand. I mean, even as well as these guys are at looking at the Moxie, it's still a guess at the end of the day because you're not looking at somebody's respiratory rate. You're not actually looking at how many liters they're expelling of CO2 or intaking of O2. So even watching as advanced as that technology is, you still really can't pinpoint exactly what the limiter is and where when it comes to an O2 delivery limited athlete, which is by far the most common in uh, CrossFit for sure. Um, so the Panoe system is, I think, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's the only uh, recognized with validation studies at least, uh, portable calorie and directometry uh, system where you can wear this device and instead of being like attached to a really long hose that's on some wheelie cart um where you have to stay on a treadmill or a bike um can you guys hear me is this thing yeah. freezing yeah you're there oh, you're good, um, yeah. uh, you can actually wear and do strength exercises for instance or crossfit wads and things like that which is why i picked up so much steam in the crossfit world and in fact i'm pretty sure every research study that's been done on CrossFit, both measuring like um, calorie expenditure, for instance, was done with the Panoa system. So it's really accurate. It's really advanced. And the main, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you could use it. Um, but I think as far as an athlete's concerned, 
it pinpoints the respiratory system and how well they can inhale O2 and expel CO2 and at what rate. So if you think about like, um, I don't know, if you think about a workout with deadlifts, right? And there's 225 for men or something, there's 50 reps of a deadlift. You would be looking at the deadlift and saying, okay, that's probably X percentage of my one rep max and it's X amount of reps at that percentage. And you can get an idea of how well you can do, how many reps you can do unbroken, how fast you can do it based on those, on that data. Um, and it's the same thing with your respiratory system, right? If you can, if you have a max VO2 max of an X amount, then you have your maximal O2 capacity. But then you have also the endurance aspect of it. Well, can I do that? How fast can I breathe? And at what depth can I hold for five minutes, six minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes? And when does that start to break down? And with the Pinoy system, you can see that directly in real time. Mm -hmm. You can see when somebody shifts from good breathing where they're taking in good O2 and expelling good CO2 to really shallow breathing where all of a sudden they're super fatigued and they lack the ability to breathe properly. And now you can see that, then you would also see in the MOXIE that their O2 goes down, they can't sustain it. Now they have to slow down. This is where their progress or their, their performance would drop. So the Pinoy is probably the only way I would say to really define the respiratory limiter of an athlete when it comes to an O2 delivery limited athlete, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you bring up a great point where like, I think the gold standard for fitness it used to be just VO2 max, right? Like keep pushing your VO2 max up and up and up and it'll make you a better athlete. But I think what we've learned with Moxie is that that's not necessarily the case because we're still not able to really pinpoint um, what's limiting your ability to hit higher VO2 maxes or even within your VO2 max, like what's, what's still the actual limiter. So I think pairing them well um, is incredibly exciting. So now, Switching gears a little bit, Devin, like when it comes to strength work and understanding Moxie and Pinoe and testing, and we're going to get into this a little bit when we talk about the kind of tests we're going to do with our members during this seminar, how can you use a Moxie to develop better strength work and this idea of like optimal volume when it comes to training? Yeah, that's a really good question. So this basically comes down, well, if I back up for a second and uh, talk about why people do strength work to begin with. And it's typically for either pure strength gain, which is a little bit different than hypertrophy or hypertrophy, which is the growth of the actual muscle tissue. And there's been a whole bunch of research on this. And there's been a lot of myths debunked and old school strategies thrown out the window. But essentially what it comes down to is maximal activation of the muscle tissue. Once you can reach peak activation of the muscle, you're going to recruit what's called high motor units. Those high motor units then recruit as many muscle fibers of that muscle as it could be recruited. That maximal recruitment of the muscle is what then signals the muscle protein synthesis to increase, which is how you would then build muscle and then strength. Strength is a little bit different from hypertrophy, um, but it's very similar. You still need peak activation like that. Uh, so with the MOXIE sensor and before the MOXIE sensor, this would essentially be you go to failure. Uh, right. There's no other way to know <laughs> what the hell peak activation was, uh, unless you were in a research study and they could actually look at the muscle tissue. Um, but for the person in the gym lifting, there was really no way to know. You would just kind of go to failure. Uh, but even going to failure may not necessarily reach peak muscle activation if techniques off, for instance, like if you're yep. doing a front squat and you're, you know, caving over because whatever your upper back is too weak or whatever it is. Your, your leg muscle may actually not be reaching peak muscle activation. So the, the reason you're squatting may be to increase leg strength, but you may not actually be getting that result as efficiently as you could. So when you put on the MOXIE sensor, again, you can actually see how well you're using oxygen in the muscle. And you will literally see that O2 go all the way down and reach a bottom point when you have maximally recruited the muscle groups because it's going to eat up all of the available oxygen. Now, what's interesting is that for people who are strong, they'll be able to desaturate that muscle pretty quickly, especially at a certain percentage, let's just say like 80%, mm -hmm. uh, because they're able to maximally recruit. They're really good at contracting that muscle tissue, which is going to eat up the oxygen. <clears throat> 
Whereas for people who are not as strong, they can't desaturate that oxygen as well because they're not really that great at coordinating the contraction of the muscle tissue. So you can see these different limiters and you can, as you're doing a set, literally see in real time how much of that oxygen is going down, which will give you a very clear black and white indication of your reaching muscle uh, activation, peak muscle activation. And if you do that with every set, of the given muscle group, it's going to be way more effective than if you were just in the gym lifting with some sort of arbitrary rep scheme, hopefully believing that you're reaching activation. So yeah. it's, it, it, it brings a whole different layer to training that would be impossible without the technology. Yeah. And, and just to, just to take, I guess, two steps back one thing. So, so there's a couple different things that happen during a muscle contraction that we can measure with Moxie and NEARS. So one's a compression, right? Just a simple contraction release. You have a venous occlusion and then you have an arterial occlusion. Do you want to just go over those terms real quick, Devin, what it means and what's actually happening in the muscle and how that drives either hypertrophy or strength? Absolutely. Yeah. So when it comes to strength and hypertrophy, uh, what we see is that the stronger or more powerful an athlete is, the more they're able to completely occlude at their arterial level, and you'll see an arterial occlusion. Now, what the hell does that mean? It basically just means that the muscle is so contracted and so powerfully contracted that nothing can go in and out, or out, rather. The blood is just pulled in, and that's it. Um, an arterial occlusion is a little bit lesser severe of an occlusion, uh, where the blood can still go in, but it can't necessarily go out. Um, that can be caused from a whole bunch of different things. Um, that I would say just to back up a second is really important with the cardiac type work, because a lot of times people will, this was myself, so I can speak <laughs> to this really well. Um, but a lot of wads or Metcons, things like that, people will get that really nasty burning, uh, their legs, their muscles. That is mostly what people are feeling is a venous occlusion. Um, on the rower bikes it's just awful uh, and that's the heart not being strong enough to pump through that occlusion when your heart gets strong enough it can actually push through and still get the blood out um, and then just back you'll notice second compression is just the contraction of the muscle which is normal that's good um, so with those three different and you can see all of that on the moxie um, and they mean different things for different people um, you know you may be trying to get an arterial occlusion if you're doing pure strength work um, and you may, that would be the last thing you wanted if you were doing, you know, a Metcon. So it depends on like what you're doing and what you're looking for and, you know, what the limiter is for you specifically. Um, but when it comes to the cardiac work, I would say the compression of venous occlusions is kind of what you're really looking at. And then when you're doing the strength work, the venous to, uh, arterial occlusions, which you're looking at, which sounds really complicated, but essentially just means how well you're contracting that muscle tissue yeah. or how powerfully rather. Yeah. And, and Robert, to bring you back into this, I know like you do a lot of hybrid programming and a lot of like um, kind of strength work that some of our members are working with you on and you program it in a way to like what Devin brought up is maximal motor unit recruitment comes near failure or taking to failure. Do you want to briefly kind of just go over without the NEARS technology, how we're trying to accomplish this with kind of what we know from evidence and science, what's the best way to create strength and hypertrophy for our clients? Yeah, so it's basically figuring out what your rep number would be per, or like for each muscle group. So say I set you at a, we do like a five, three to five rep max. We find your estimated one RM and then I set you to 70% for equal shoulder press and back squat. So based on those two numbers, let's say you hit like eight reps for your shoulder press and you hit some arbitrary number of like 10 for your back squat. So those are your numbers that I'm gonna set you at because it's kind of like a best guess as to those being your closest numbers to let's say one to three reps till failure. And each week I'm gonna gradually increase your weight and just you're supposed to slightly keep adapting to that specific number. And then once you reach that number, we intensify the weight if you're unable to get to that number anymore. But basically it's kind of like a best guess like Devin was saying earlier in regards to like, if we don't have that information with like the moxie or the nears, we can't actually see where the reps and the sets are no longer of value. So we just kind of keep progressing as we can through those weights and those reps till you're unable to hit those reps and those weights anymore. Yeah. Going back to Devin's terminology, like we're basically guessing that you're having a yeah. venous or arterial, arterial occlusion at those reps and we're kind of just trying to work our way through it, but it's, it's a guess. It's not for certain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so 
what's interesting about it is the idea of volume and being able to effectively determine the amount of volume that someone does to drive the adaptation that we want. Because, you know, even in our general programming, we'll come in and say, hey, guys, like we're going to build up to a five rep max, a daily five rep max, which again, going back to our conversation, like we're guessing at Venus artillery occlusion, then we're going to do three drop sets at like 80% or something like that to get an extra volume. Um, Devin, like where, where does this idea of using nears to be more productive about the amount of work we're actually doing come into play? And where does this add value to people's life instead of just doing this blanket, like everyone's going to do this because it's our best guess of what's going to drive adaptation for individuals. Yeah, so I think the one thing that kind of cracks me up when I think about this is that um, when you put on, you know, everybody, everybody likes to think they go to failure. I think, you know, when you say uh, go to failure minus one or something for three sets of back squat, uh, what that's supposed to mean is that you do one rep shy of just not being able to do it, right? So let's say you could, if you barely could get, you know, eyes are bleeding blood to get 10 reps, you would stop at nine, right? Now, if you put the moxie on, you can actually see failure. If you know how to you know, read the moxie, you look at the SMO2 levels and all that kind of stuff, you can quite literally see if the muscle can do another rep or two. Um, and what's funny is, you know, there's a lot of research on, on volume and, and proper sets per muscle group. And I believe for athletes, it's somewhere around 10 to 10 to 12 sets per muscle group per week is like the maximal you know, or uh, not maybe not maximum, but around where they should be to reach peak hypertrophy or strength gains per week or something like that. But all this research is always done to quote failure, but whether they're actually going to failure or not is very like, gray. We don't really know. And some of the research I kind of laugh because there's no way they're going to failure. If you look at the actual way it's set up, but with the Moxie, I think, bar none the best thing about it is you can actually see if you're going to failure or not which some people don't want to see uh there would be definitely some times where i'll put the monitor right in front of me while i'm doing something and i will be doing like a strict press and uh i'll never forget this one time i was doing strict presses i think i was usually only getting like seven to eight and i'm staring at the screen right in front of me and it's literally telling me you're fine and I feel like I'm shaking, I'm dying, I'm like crying blood, but I still can do another rep or two. And I did. And it was, it was very strange. Uh, so I think just having people get an actual concept of what going to failure really means alone is amazingly effective. Because even if you're doing the right amount of sets per muscle group per week, uh, you know, and that's great. It doesn't mean anything if you're not recruiting the high motor units and that's only done when you get close proximity to failure. So yeah. all of your training could be worthless if you're not actually getting to where you need to get to. And the moxie right in front of you will tell you if you're doing that or not, whether you yeah. want to see it or not, it's up to you, but yeah, I <laughs> love tell it. You. yeah, guys in, in our, in our last 10 minutes now, let's, let's pivot to the actual seminar. So Devin, we got an AM group and a PM group and we're doing kind of two different things on those groups. So let's talk about the AM group first what we're going to measure with Panoe and Moxie in terms of like kind of the resting test with Panoe, see how you're burning fuel and how that drives nutrition. And then when using the Moxie for strength work. So just real quick, give people like the, the we'll call it the three minute elevator pitch on what we're going to be doing. Yeah. So in the AM session, we'll be doing the uh, Panoe, which is going to give you a resting metabolic rate, which is super useful. I mean, it's, it's as accurate as you could possibly get anywhere of how many calories your body burns at rest. Um, and that's super useful because you cannot be in a calorie deficit or surplus or maintenance or anything if you don't know what the hell calories it takes for your body to run. So without that, you're just guessing at everything. So the Panoe will give you a very, very, very laboratory grade accuracy of how many calories your body burns at rest. And we'll describe what that means at the seminar itself. Yeah. Um, and then in, in combination with that, we're going to use the Moxie for the strength testing, just like what I was just saying, where that Moxie is going to be right in front of us. And we're going to know when you're doing a set, how close you're getting to failure, what that actually feels like, um, what reps you come out with so that you can use that in your training from then on. So it's not just 
information you're going to get in that minute of, oh shit, I did it or not, it's actually going to be super useful for you to actually then use it in your own programming, which I'm sure you'll give at the gym or whatever. If they're not at the gym, they can do it on their own. Uh, but it'll give you a lot of information on exactly where that muscle is reaching that high motor unit recruitment, which is literally what we're after if we're doing strength. If you don't reach that, then it's almost useless. So you're going to know exactly what that feels like and exactly what rep scheme at a certain percentage that would be for you. So you know what reps to focus on. Uh, in yeah. your own. And that's and yeah. And I know, and I know Brad uh, Schoenfeld has done a lot of research, like hypertrophy can exist mm -hmm. anywhere between like 30 and 70 or 30 and 80, 90% of your one rep max, depending on what your limiter is, like you may need 90% of your one rep max to drive hypertrophy adaptation for some others. It could be as small as 40. And so Robert going just real quick, going to you, like people who are doing hybrid, all that additional strength work, how can you probably take this information and start incorporating it into their programming? What, what are your ideas? What are you thinking? Uh, like Devin just said, you can take those actual reps with those certain percentages that we're going to use at the seminar and just translate that right over to your actual strength training literally the next week. And we can kind of keep driving those adaptations week to week based yeah. on what the Moxie had told us that day. And some of us, some of your clients might be surprised how much less volume they may end up doing or how much more volume they may end up doing, depending yeah, on the results, which is either exciting or, or going to be brutal. <laughs> so, yeah. Some people are going to have to check their egos at the door. To yeah, see a little bit. Yeah. Like we, we're not at failure yet, guys. We got to push a little bit harder, um, <laughs> which is exciting. You know, again, like our, our whole goal here is to add more personalization and value to your, to your training, because it's important to get the most out of your whatever effort you're expending in the gym. So then Devin, let's jump to the PM session. What are we going to be doing and uh, what can people look forward to? Yeah. So the PM is definitely the more in-depth version, uh, both because you get a lot more information, but also because it's a lot more time consuming. So we can use both the Moxie and the Panoe together to go over the energetic limiters that we were talking about in the beginning. So, I mean, this is where, man, you'll walk away from that knowing more about yourself than you probably ever have in your athletic life, period. Um, you'll not only know, what your limiter is uh, in terms of your energetic limiters that we were talking about before, whether it's O2 delivery or utilization and whether it's respiratory or whether it's uh, cardiac based. So you'll have that insight. Then you'll also have the insight, especially even if it's not respiratory limited, you still want to know where your respiratory rates and gas exchanges are. Yep. Also be able to see not only exactly the information in terms of your respiratory rate per minute, your O2 depth, your CO2, how, how much you can expel. Uh, but then you'll also be able to see how much fuel you're using and where that fuel is coming from. Is it more fat-based? Is it more carbohydrate-based? Um, so this can not only give you massive insight as to your own athletic performance in terms of your limiters and how to improve them and, and where to go and blah, 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 but also even your nutrition as it, as it uh, relates to your performance, what you're using, how much, and that's, I mean... <laughs> I wish I had my hands on this years ago. Like the, yeah. the amount of information you can get out of this is just bar none. It, I mean, I mean, this this wasn't even possible unless you were either I don't know, a millionaire or in the laboratory itself up until now. So I mean, the fact that you can get if you care about your performance at all, then this this should be like number one to you yep. by far because the fact that we can even see these things is absolutely incredible so you'll be walking away with exactly what your limiters are when it comes to performance and how to fix them and exactly what your respiratory system is, is able to do and how to improve that yeah and then robert just to take this back to you to put a bow on it so like if, if someone if we learn that through this testing with devin that like someone oxidizes fat a lot more than we thought they did at higher intensities. What are, what's some of the things you can do with their nutrition or macros to kind of tweak things to say, okay, we can make this a little bit more custom for, for you and your performance. Well, based on whatever it may come out to be, it's either like a higher fat, higher carb type diet. And like for uh, some people, like you guys are going to dive into genomics here later is uh, we found out that Miranda is actually person that utilizes fat a little bit more. So like she could actually kind of tailor back in the carb department. So it's just kind of figuring out those little nuances to kind of tailor the programming more specifically to you as a person. Versus just kind of guessing like, Hey, tell me how you feel. And maybe we make adjustments from there. And then on the performance side, Robert, like if someone is, uh, 
utilization limited, cardiac limited, or respiratory limited, like what's something that they could probably apply to their general metcons to work on these limiters? Like what things come to mind when it I comes to specifically those? just like rowing or biking, typical like energy system protocols that we'd have to take them through in regards to help them improve their overall metcon capacity, because just kind of putting them through a simple metcon isn't always going to give the most bang for their buck. There's different compensations yep. people make with different movements they make. So ideally I'd probably strap you to a rower or a bike and kind of see what goes on in that yeah. scenario. Yeah. Very cool. You guys. Well, again, Devin, appreciate the time, man. Um, obviously excited. Um, how many, how many people remind me, did we reserve for the AM group and the PM group? I think PM, we were looking at six athletes, six or seven is yeah, the would, tops. And then what are we thinking in the yeah. AM? I think we had double that. I think okay. We were in 12 um in the pm session i think already was booked up right yeah yeah we're definitely getting some i know me robert miranda probably gonna be a couple other people that are gonna jump all over that so <laughs> you're at least gonna get my coaching stuff you're ready <laughs> so, um but i think what's exciting about it is guys like this is the very tip of the spear when it comes to like understanding in the time and energy that you're putting in the gym and what we can do is get very specific and personal about what's going on with you and if you decide to come to the genomics seminar as well, that's even, that's you in a bottle. Like that's the most personal it's going to get. And so hopefully we can have you on both days if you're available. And uh, yeah, Devin, thanks for taking the time, man. And uh, we'll see you uh, weekend over the 28th and 29th. I'm, I'm pumped. We'll be ready. Let's All right, it. you guys. Awesome. See ya.